This is the, the recap for the reading on sleep. Um, these are the learning objectives, being able to define these key terms. <clears throat> there are some brain regions on there that you don't need to know the anatomy for, uh, just the, uh, the function, what they're involved in. The reticular formation is a brainstem region. You, you'll see um, <clears throat> there's a table I'll show later that shows the pontomesencephalon, and that is part of the brain, or the reticular formation. There's lots of subregions to it. Um, you don't need to know that term, the pontomesencephalon, but know that that is part of the reticular formation. Okay, uh, some sleep disorders and hormones on there. One anatomical term that we'll add um, for this um, section is the pineal gland. And these are the learning objectives. There are multiple sleep stages, there are four, and one of them is REM sleep. <clears throat> you don't need to know all four, but you do need to be able to distinguish REM sleep from the non-REM sleep. So what, what sets REM apart? Uh, differences in thalamic activity, and and then there's a there's a table as I mentioned, um, and that'll that'll um, summarize the basic roles of the um, neurotransmitters um, listed there, and which brain regions release them. Okay, so first this concept of a, a circadian rhythm. So these are changes that occur in the body and in behavior that follow a daily cycle. Uh, evolutionary theory would postulate that having evolved on a planet that experiences light and dark cycles, um, a lot of our body is tuned into this rhythm. And not just in the brain, but all across the body, there are um, changes in physiology and behavior that follow a, a daily cycle. <clears throat> um, just as an FYI, a circannual rhythm is something that would follow uh, a yearly cycle. So there are some things that change, um, follow that um, that kind of rhythm. The retinohypothalamic pathway. This has a nice informative name. Um, this is a pathway that goes from the retina to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is involved in uh, regulating our circadian rhythm and establishing that rhythm. <clears throat> Now it has to get some kind of an input to know when it's, when it's light and when it's dark. And there are ganglion cells in the retina that respond to light. Now you remember the ganglion cells, they're actually a couple of cells down the chain. Um, the photoreceptors are the cells that we typically think of as being the, the photosensitive layer, but there are some ganglion cells that do respond to light. And they send axons to the hypothalamus. There's a specific region of the hypothalamus, the SCN, or the suprachiasmatic nucleus specifically that they send them to. These mainly respond to short wave wavelength light. Um, so you may recall short wavelength, that's more on the blue-green side of the spectrum as opposed to red, yellow, orange. And LCD screens tend to have more of this short wavelength light, that bluish light. So this is one reason underlying um, sleep disturbances that can occur if you're spending too much time on screens um, right before going to bed. The locus aurelius. Um, this is a small group of cells in the ponds. Uh, these are, this is one of the uh, brain regions underlying, uh, uh, that subserves the diffuse modulator system. So this is one uh, diffuse modulator they're referred to. There are some other ones. Um, cluster of cells um, that release serotonin and cluster of cells that release dopamine. Um, the cells here release norepinephrine and they're involved in increasing arousal and wakefulness. Um, also enhancing attention um, and memory. Um, there's an interesting relationship between uh, arousal and attention and the activity of these neurons in the locus aurelius or LC as you can see abbreviated there in that figure. Can see if there's a little bit of so those um, jaggedy spike things represent action potentials, and you can see with a little bit of spiking, then you're inattentive, non-alert. If you have a lot of it, um, then it's um, labile attention, kind of 
um, distracted by, um, um, all, you know, whatever kind of stimulus. And when you have, there's kind of that sweet spot. So you have this inverted U relationship where focused attention, where you usually want to be, uh, is kind of this, this sweet spot of activity. Um, melatonin, uh, another key term. This is a hormone uh, released by the pineal gland. Right? You've probably heard of melatonin. It's something you can buy in a health food store. Um, this is um, a hormone that increases sleepiness. It increases two to three hours before bedtime. Um, so the hypothalamus regulates the release of melatonin from the pineal gland. So this is one thing that is going to help to establish that circadian rhythm. Um, these melatonin supplements, they won't do you, because it increases two to three hours before bedtime, they won't do you a whole lot of good if you're trying to go to sleep right before bed because melatonin levels are already high because of that increase long before. Okay, here's some anatomy, um, some of which you need to know and some of which is just an FYI. The basal forebrain um, is, you can see it's that region of the um, the frontal lobe, kind of that um, ventromedial aspect. Um, and there's there's different terms that you could use to describe that region, um, but that's where the basal forebrain is, is located. It's a cluster of neurons there. Um, or the, there is a cluster of neurons there that release acetylcholine. And then the pineal gland, um, this isn't a very good um, image, but it's, it's right there um, just behind where the thalamus would be. And this is a mid-sagittal cut, uh, sagittal slice. And it, it's kind of shriveled in this uh, picture, but that's where it'd be that, that yellow um, outline. Um, that's where the pineal gland is. Here's maybe a better um, depiction, kind of a cartoon depiction. These are all terms that you've either learned before or need to know. Remember where the pituitary gland is, um, and then the pineal gland is, um, is more um, towards the back, more po posterior, uh, kind of just below the, the, the corpus callosum um, towards the posterior end of the, of the thalamus. And it's something that you would see on a mid-sagittal cut. Um, it, it's a very small structure, and um, you would pretty much... Um, it would be hard to identify it in anything besides a, a mid-sagittal section. So um, just to give a brief intro to EEG, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show some EEG data on the next slides. I just wanted to um, briefly introduce it. We'll talk more about it next unit. Um, EEG stands for electroencephalography. This is uh, a technique used to measure electri electrical activity um, in the brain. Um, the neurons that are firing just under the scalp. Uh, it doesn't tell you much about deep structures, or at least you um, you could infer some things. Um, but but really, it's it's looking at cortical activity. Um, it's a common technique. Um, it's used in a lot of domains of neuroscience. Um, but one prominent use is is to study sleep cycles. Okay, so this is what some EEG um, data would look like. Um, that's the blue. Um, the blue uh, squiggles up there on the, on those graphs. And you can see there the uh, there's a wake, and then there's stages one, two, three, and four. Um, and then you have REM sleep, or rapid eye movement um, sleep, um, also called paradoxical sleep. So um, one thing that makes it paradoxical is that it your EEG signature actually looks um, more similar to being awake um, than to being, say, in stage four sleep. So uh, in many ways, you're, it's almost like your, your brain is awake, um, but you're still asleep. There are um, two things, uh, two characteristics in which the EEG waves differ between REM sleep and um, uh, the, the, the best comparison is between stage four sleep. That's where it's the most apparent. They differ in their amplitude, and they also differ in um, synchrony. So the, uh, the amplitude is, if you recall from when we talked about audition, amplitude is like the height of the wave. Um, so the, the waves here are much taller. Um, and so 
um, in stage four sleep than in REM. So stage four has higher amplitude. So REM sleep is lower amplitude. Now in terms of the synchrony, um, stage four actually has a higher level of synchrony. Uh, and the analogy that I use, it seems a little counterintuitive, um, but if you were trying to do the wave um, in a great big stadium, if you're trying to get the crowd to do the wave, um, if you want to be able to see that wave moving through um, the stadium, everybody needs to be kind of synced up. Um, they need to all be, you know, you need to have a group of people that are all moving up and raising their arms at the same time and then coming down back at the same time. So that's a high level of synchrony, and that's when you can actually see those waves go up and down. Whereas if everybody wasn't, wasn't synced up, um, if they were all just kind of doing their own little wave all at the same time, then you would get a very random looking pattern. And that's what you see um, in REM sleep. So stage four sleep reflects a higher degree of synchrony um, in the brain where um, the neurons are kind of fluctuating their activity in sync. Uh, whereas in REM sleep, they're all kind of doing their same thing, um, doing their own thing and not in sync. And that's more similar to what's happening when you're awake.